another tense day in Moscow and another game when chess fans from around the world were demanding more active chess from the players. Hello, this is Daniel King reporting on Game 7 of the World Chess Championship. Let's take a look and see what happened. Gelfand had the white pieces and he opened with d4 as ever and we had once again a semi-slav from the players and Gelfand was the first to vary. So far in this match we've had queen c2 and b3. This time he played c5 which leads to a more closed position and well actually keeps the tension for a lot longer in the game. Uh, if you'll remember that in previous games there have been a lot of pawn exchanges in the middle of the board but this one keeps the position quite blocked. Now, black really has to try to counter counteract white's space advantage here, and you can do that with two different pawn breaks, either with e5 or b6. Well, obviously e5 isn't isn't possible straight away, but after after knight d7, the next move in the game. Now, queen c2 is pretty normal. Um, that's directed against b6, really. Now e5 is possible, uh, and that's very theoretical and very sharp. Instead, Anand chose b6. That's the other way of breaking down white's pawn chain. So white takes, and knight takes. Okay, these, these moves are pretty sensible. And now, of course, black is left with this so-called backward c-pawn on c6. So you have to try and get rid of that. Okay, this, this makes a lot of sense. Okay, so Gelfand develops his queen side quickly. Black takes, and this to some extent gives black a structural advantage because white is left with an isolated d-pawn. The problem for black is that it's actually very hard to attack that pawn. So in fact white is okay here. Now bishop d6. Now this is the first moment in the game where a lot of uh, chess fans were calling for a very interesting move here and a more active move than Gelfand played. Gelfand played bishop g5 but a lot of people were suggesting knight a4, a very interesting move indeed because white threatens bishop a5 and if black takes then check. Okay, you've got to save the rook in the corner and queen takes d6 and of course black can take on b2 but white has certain compensation here in the form of these black squares and it's going to be difficult for, for black to castle. Gelfand said he saw it and just felt that okay he said it's complicated but he just felt that bishop g5 was a better move so keeping things pretty calm, a calm move and sensible move of course pinning here. Okay let's rattle on with the moves both sides developing very nicely and I'll get to the next critical point in the game. Now here black has to solve the problem of this pin. White is just going to play knight e5 and develop very naturally you know, his middle game. Black played queen b8. Probably a good move from Anand. Um, it kind of cuts the Gordian knot. It gets out of this pin but of course in doing so you allow bishop takes f6 and here there was massive disappointment when Gelfand played bishop g3, just neutralizing black's bishop on d6. Now positionally this is a very sound move because you want to try and get control of the c5 and e5 squares. But a crowd was baying for bishop takes knight, breaking up the pawns on the king side. In fact, Gary Kasparov and Nigel Short, who were watching this this game live both thought that white should play like this but Gelfand said afterwards well black's bishop can come back to, to f8 and the queen comes to d6 and although yeah maybe this knight can come in here but black can probably defend and he just felt that black was alright in this position so it's interesting two different styles Gelfand played in a much more positional way exchanging off this so-called, well, a good bishop here on d6 that controls these squares. So Gelfand remained true to himself. He didn't go in for unnecessary complications. The problem with, by the way, the problem with bishop takes f6 is that if you, if you don't deliver checkmate,
then it's quite nice that this pawn here controls e5, preventing the knight reaching this good square on e5. So Gelfand's move much more positional. He can still move his knight to e5. And how? Let's see what happened later on in the game. Okay, it seems like Anand is okay here, and he, he probably is. And here, perhaps he should have just doubled on the C file and played rook C7. And he's perhaps slightly worse, but it doesn't seem so bad to me. This bishop is a slight problem. You can see it's locked in here. White pieces are a bit better. That pawn is a bit weak. But it doesn't seem so bad for black. This is the first move where Anand started to drift. I don't like rook a b8. It doesn't seem to achieve much. And I like knight a4. Now you can see the importance of these squares. If white can land his knights here, then he's doing pretty well. Knight e4 came from Anand. He probably should have taken on c2. This knight e4 was not the best move after rook takes. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe... Well, no, he, he can't take here, of course, because white wins pawn on e4. So he had to play bishop takes c8. And now it's not so nice. The queen swings across, and suddenly Gelfand is in control. He's got control of the c file. He's looking to play his queen down to c7. He's still looking at these squares for the knights as well. Gelfand is suddenly doing well. And, well, maybe after bishop b7 it's not so bad. But now Anand lashed out with g5. And this was, I think, un uncalled for. Anand did not need to play this move. Um, I think it's a bit desperate. And suddenly, after Queen C7, he was in massive trouble. And you could see, it, or kind of sitting there, all the air had gone out of Anand. He'd kind of slumped at the board. And this is a horrible position for Black to play because he has no counterplay. Look at that bishop. It has no moves. Let's see how the game develops. Gelfand played very simply. He took off that active knight swung the knight round and now you can see those knights cruising into black's position again it's these dark squares and it's all because that dark square bishop was exchanged by Gelfand a move that was criticized by Kasparov no less but it's going to win Gelfand the game watch what happens to those white knights look every picture tells a story and this one tells the story that Anand is completely lost. White dominates here. That bishop has no moves. The pawns are going to drop off. Black's king is in terrible trouble. And that's a consequence of these pawns advancing. The king is trapped on the back rank. And now Gelfand is in. Anand tried desperately for counterplay, giving up his bishop but here it's it's fruitless. Let's see how Gelfand finished it off. He finished it off with a nice bit of calculation. If the king comes up the board, it gets checkmated. There's nothing to do about knight g7, so the king went back. And now a little bit of sharp calculation from Gelfand. Knight e5, allowing this pawn to go on, but now it's going to be checkmate. And in this position, Anand resigned. Let's see what happens if he gets a queen. Check. You can even queen with check. Black has, a, uh, black has a whole move to do something with the queen, but the king is safe, and on the next turn there is going to be knight g6 and rook g7 mate, and there is nothing to do about that. Let's just see that, just to show you. There we go, and Anand cannot prevent that, so he resigned. I think an excellent game from Gelfand. He remained true to himself. But a very disappointing game from Anand. He seemed to lack spark in this game. He found no counterplay whatsoever and lost really quite simply in the end. So Gelfand goes one game up after seven games in this 12 game match. Anand has all to play for. What can he do to come back in this match?